Hey everybody, it's Jenny from Growth Mode Marketing. You're listening to Demand Gen Fix, the podcast where our team of growth motors and our guests discuss the ins and outs of demand generation and why we believe it's the key to long-term sustainable growth, especially in the HR tech industry. Hello and welcome back to the Demand Gen Fix podcast. Deanna and Greg and I are back this week and we're going to be talking about a topic that's near and dear to our hearts and that is developing your unique point of view. We have touched on this topic in the past because it's a it's one of the pillars of our company and what we do. And so it's very important to us, but we've never really gone into the details on how to define that. And defining and constantly delivering a unique point of view does help you break through the clutter and stand out in an overly crowded market, especially something like the HR tech technology space. So we want to dig in, uh, try and identify some of the steps and how you can go ahead and develop your own unique point of view and build out your story and your framework for your company. Let's start with talking about what a unique point of view is, because I know not all our listeners have uh, listened to past episodes where maybe we talked about it. And the way that I think about it is it's the story you tell in the market to drive awareness, build trust, and ultimately build demand for your products and services. And it's not specifically about your products and services, although you want to be able to tie that in. It's about how you view a relevant challenge or issue in your market. And so it's got to be an angle that your company can stand behind that is different than what prospects are hearing from competitors. Yeah, that's one of the key things I think is that it's different from the competitors. You know, everybody kind of says the same thing. We save you money or we do it faster. You know, it's so you want to have something that breaks you out from that sameness that makes you unique. Right. And I think, you know, companies don't realize how much they sound like the competitors. And then we'll do a competitive analysis and start to break out things. And we'll show like, here's statements you could say that they say and that everybody says, you know, like when you really start to compare it and dissect what companies are saying out there, they don't sound as different as they think they do oftentimes. And from a buyer perspective, That certainly is what they see. And so everybody starts to blend together in that sea of sameness and it can be overwhelming for the buyers. And you certainly don't want to get lumped into that category when you're being considered for a solution out there. Yeah, if everybody sounds the same, then it's kind of like, what do do you have to judge based on? You know, price. And I don't Mm -hmm. know that everybody wants to play in the price game, right? So so you want to be sound different so so you have more value. So how do we go about identifying the company's unique point of view? I feel like you maybe have all of the bits and pieces there. It's just kind of about digging in and not necessarily reinventing the wheel, but kind of digging in to see what points of view already live in the minds of your team. It's likely that the thoughts for unique point of view already live in the minds of your team. Now, it's a different story if you're pivoting and you're developing your messaging for the first time. But if you're developing a unique point of view for a market that you're very familiar with, that you've been selling into, what you're going to find is, I think if you dig deep with your team, you're going to find a story that resonates with your best fit prospects, which are your ideal customer profile. And, And I think it's really important to call out that it is so critical that your story is built around your ideal customer profile because you want it to resonate with them. You don't want to be everything to everyone in the marketing that you're doing, or you will continue to blend into that sea of sameness. But if you think about uh, people in your organization who are customer facing, who are prospect facing, they're having conversations every day. They're picking up nuggets. They probably have thoughts that live in the back of their mind of these are the things that make people's eyes light up when we talk about this topic. That's what you want to embrace as part of your unique point of view. Yeah. What are the issues that are really on their mind, right? Like what's the challenges that your ICP has? so that you can talk to them, talk with them, and they say, oh, these people get me. You know, they understand that. They understand <laughs> right. the industry. They, under- they know who I am. And then once you've distinguished what your unique point of view is, you're going to want to weave it throughout all of your content, your speaking engagements, your sales conversations. You're going to be telling that story over and over and over 
And your goal is to attract those best fit clients who are your ideal customer profile. So, you know, once you've got that laid out, once you've got your unique point of view, it becomes easier and easier to talk about it and to engage with those people because you're doing it over and over again. When you're telling that story consistently and repeatedly, the goal is to attract that ideal customer profile, those right fit clients. And so knowing it takes on average, according to Gartner now, 66 touches, you need them to pay attention 66 times in order for them to be like, hey, this is resonating. This is a company I want to work with and really start to pay attention. And so like, let's dig into how do you actually build out your unique point of view? And when we do it, we look at it as a story framework, but there's lots of steps and it sounds really straightforward, but you know, there's a lot that goes into the back end to build out that framework. Let's talk about that and what it looks like at Growth Mode Marketing when we're working with clients. Like we were talking about before with the ideal customer profile, you need to start there because, you know, that's the, it's the first step because that's the person you're trying to reach, right? So you need to, you know, you're going to have a map. You need to have a goal of where your map is taking you. So that's the ICP. So that's the first thing you have to do is have that defined. Right. And we certainly have clients who will come and already have their ideal customer profile defined. And we pick up then at that unique point of view story framework and mapping that out. But if you don't have the ideal customer profile mapped out yet, um, you know, we'll push back and we'll say, hey, we have to define this before it makes sense to really create your unique point of view. Otherwise, it's going to be too broad and it's not going to be as impactful for you. Then I think the second thing that you need to start with is the competitive review. You need to look at who are the company's competitors. You know, I would say at least three to six. Look at their messaging. What do they have on their websites, their social media profiles, in their sales literature? Do they have a point of view? Do they have something that's distinctive to them? Do they maybe sound just like everybody else? Do all six of them sound the same? You know, how different is the message across each of your competitors. Do they use very general statements or do they have a very specific tagline or specific thing that they stand behind? Right, and we find companies in the same space often sound the same. It's very common and you know we could probably talk about an example. I know, Greg, you've been working recently with a payroll service provider who is actually transitioning to become a human capital management service and technology provider. So in their case, it's not pulling what we already know out of their heads. It's helping them kind of define it for the first time. But let's talk a little bit about how, as we looked at competitors, like what are some of the common statements that came out? Because I think that will really help our audience understand what we mean by you all sound the same. We have a uh, like a template, sort of a grid. So, you, and we put each um, competitor into the grid and fill out the you know fill out what are the, what are they saying you know what what's their you know what's their market like who are they targeting and things like that and and try to so that you can compare each different competitor on one you know basically one page for each and then you can look at it and you can see what's different about them and a lot of times what happens is. Especially, it seems like with with payroll, it's like payroll is it's our people that are the greatest, which could very well be true. But you know, nine times out of ten, most of the other companies are saying it's our people, or they say you know something like you know we save you time and money. When you're in a room developing these phrases, they all sound great, right? It's like these great lofty things that you you're developing for your company. But then when you compare it to everybody else, it kind of falls flat because everybody else can say the same thing. So that's where you try, we try to map it all out so at least we can see what people are saying so we can find those little holes to plug in for this unique point of view. Right. I feel like everybody wants to work with really good people. Everyone wants to save time and money. Everyone wants to focus on what matters most. All of those things are great. And everybody wants that in the business that they choose to do business with. However, if 10 different businesses are saying that, who are you going to pick? There's got to be something in there that is a little bit different, something that pushes you over the edge to make you choose that company. Yeah. And, and what we have found is actually when we start to look at competitors, many companies, and in fact, a surprising amount of companies don't have 
a clear point of view or a differentiation point that when you look at their marketing content online and their digital footprint is clear and obvious. And they may have gone through message positioning exercises. They may have defined like, here's our product differentiators, but their language still starts to sound very similar, you know, like some actual statements taken from a competitor in this case. Ease your HR workload and help your company save money. Help you focus on what matters most, running your business. Save time and money, help ensure compliance and empower your employees to succeed. Streamline your operations and drive performance. Now, if you stop and think about that, if you're an HR technology company, or even if you're in a different space and you're just a technology company, like how many of those statements actually apply to what you do and the problems you solve for clients? You're probably it like, should be all oh, of them. right. <laughs> you know, in a lot of cases, this is very relevant what they're saying. And this is the kind of language that typically comes out of companies. So like I said, it's really surprising as we dig in that there is no clear differentiator. And, you know, when you do the differentiation exercise where we're helping you map out your unique point of view story framework, you're basically, you know, figuring out like the blueprint for what is the story we're going to tell consistently in the market and what are the challenges we're going to talk about. And yep, all the things we just said as examples might fall into that. But when you apply that buyer persona or that ideal customer profile to it and you start to narrow it down, now I'm talking about it but in a sense that is very relevant to you for the size that you're at as an organization, for the industry that you're in, for the role that you're in. I mean, you're really getting very hyper-focused and specific in that story you're telling so that it resonates better with them. So you want to start by analyzing those things that you have already in your existing resources, which, you know, as we said, you should already have your ideal customer profile. Most likely you've gone through a buyer personas exercise as well. So take a look at those. Do some voice of customer research, you know, see what what your customers are saying, you know, really get a good idea of, of good and bad what is being said about your company. Um, and then do a messaging positioning exercise as well. You know, this will help you maybe define whether or not you do have a clear differentiator as opposed to some of your other competitors. Um, are you actually focused on the buyer's pain points? You know, are you, do you know who your ideal customer profile is and what their pain points are? And are you focusing on that? And do you sound different than everybody else in the industry? You know, are you saying the same things? Because if you are, then you're just one in that that same pool and you're not going to ever stand out. So you need to take a look at all of those resources you already have and really dive deep and analyze those. Yeah. And as, as part of the unique point of view story framework that we do at Growth Mode Marketing we're building the framework, you know, we're not doing message positioning. That's a whole different thing. We're not doing voice of customer research for this particular project. But what we're looking for and what you should be looking for as you're analyzing your existing resources are, do you have that information today? Because if you do, it can really help feed the direction of your unique point of view story framework If you don't have any of those resources, and quite frankly, you know, every once in a while we run into clients where they don't have all those things built out, then there's a little more heavy lifting up front to start to understand some of those things so that you can proceed with creating a unique point of view story framework. If you don't have them, okay, we'll figure it out. But you at least got to have the customer profile mapped out and defined. Those assets really help when you're starting to, you know, get your group of people together and try to put together a conversation or a workshop with the people from your team. Having any of that background material helps you to figure out like where to start the conversation, right? So so after you've looked through all that stuff, it'll give you a chance to kind of think of what, are, what you know, at least to start the conversation and then, you know, select a bunch of team members, some key team members that'll participate in a in some work sessions to kind of flesh that out and kind of pick holes in the ideas and, and kind of figure out where you want this thing to go and how you know how to shape it. So it's important to really have, you know, some good people in the beginning, like we were saying before, people that have been in the industry for a while or with the company for a long time. Probably like five to seven people. We usually recommend like a CEO, 
um, a marketing leader, a sales leader, customer service leader, product leader. So people that, you know, that understand the problems that are out there from different perspectives, right? because we want to be able to look at it from all different angles with different points of view so that we can, uh, you know, you can dig through these ideas and poke holes in each other's ideas. To your point, Greg, it is important to have the right people from your team participate in the process, but not too many people, because if you start to go beyond that five to seven participants, it starts to be too many cooks in the kitchen. I think it's also important that when you look at who's going to be a part of that conversation, the reason, you know, we're saying like, hey, look at the CEO and the senior leaders in marketing, sales, customer service product is we want people that are strategic and can think about it. Because what we've found when we're working with clients is if you're bringing people into the process who aren't as strategic, they have a hard time thinking outside of like, well, this is how it works right now. And this is how the product works. And and they're very focused on the day to day, and not necessarily able to be a visionary. And I think when you're developing your unique point of view story framework, there has to be a level of ability to think Think strategically about the future and have a vision for how do we talk about this? You know, what do people's eyes light up over talking about it in a sense that is much strategic and higher level and talking about challenges and issues and problems in the market versus the day to day? Well, their payroll was wrong, so we had to correct it, and that caused a lot of work. And, you know, like, If you're too day-to-day in the thinking around it, it really limits what story you come out of the workshops with. So what's the best way to to go forward once you've got this group of people together? Well, I'd say in the beginning, what we we like to do and what what seems to work well is to take some of that material that you've collected and some of the ideas that you have and and create a a digital questionnaire to send out to the the group of people that you you hopefully have agreed to participate, right? Because you want to give them a heads up first of what, what is this all about? And then, you know, and then obviously that the, this questionnaire is coming. And the questionnaire is just to kind of start to frame out what you want to have in a real conversation. And it's important that you talk about those challenges, who the audience is, maybe what um, people think are the company's superpowers. So some examples of questions could be, you know, like what's a challenge in the industry that we could debate over all night, you know, sitting with a glass of wine or whatever the favorite beverages. What are they going to get like, you know, their dander up about? What are they going to like get excited about? Because those are the types of things, you know, that's going to start to resonate. Same thing. It could be problems within your company or, you know, how does the company view the problem? Just things to kind of get people thinking and thinking, you know, strategically. The digital questionnaire absolutely serves a couple of things when we send it out. We do want to get people to start thinking about it before we bring them into workshops. So we're asking questions to kind of probe like, hey, really think deep about this. Come prepared to that conversation. It also allows us to collect initial thoughts, comments, and themes so that we have some direction in that workshop. We're just We're not just walking in there and asking every, you know, client we work with the exact same questions. We're looking at it and saying, okay, here's some things that were really interesting that came out of the digital questionnaires. Here's some things where we can tell, okay, this person's not thinking strategically about it. We know that going in. How do we reframe some of these questions and and dig a little deeper to get them to do that? And ultimately, what it allows us to do then is to shape that discussion guide to then go into our workshop sessions. And our workshop sessions, you know, we're going to do two to three with a client. We're taking the responses we've already collected from them, and we're going to focus on the prospect challenges and the problems, and we're going to dig deep into those themes. So it's all about poking holes in thoughts and looking at it from every angle. And we want the team members that are participating in that from the client side to understand that and also poke holes in the ideas and have a conversation with each other versus just telling us like, oh, it's this. You know, and sometimes that's a little bit like pulling teeth. You know, I think it can be a little bit uncomfortable to get pushback on ideas and thoughts 
But that's all part of the process is, you know, let's discuss how your industry expertise, products and services address these challenges. And if what you're giving as responses aren't actually addressing those challenges and meeting that, we'll push harder. We'll help the team get there so that at the end of the day, we can really map out that unique point of view story framework. Yeah, just one thing to add on top of that is just making sure everybody is free and open and comfortable. Like it's not, there's no right answer. There's Mm -hmm. no wrong answer. It's really just a conversation to try to figure out what are these themes and, you know, and ideas that we can start to weave together to, you know, to make the totally. So that's, that's an important part, like setting the whole thing up from the beginning, right? Make sure everybody knows it's not, nothing personal. It's just all ideas. It's all open and throw it out on the table so we can see what's there and, and make something of it. Make sure that people don't think it's an argument. Got to work together to get to the end result. Yeah. And I can tell you, you know, there's times where we're working with clients and they'll they'll hit on something that we're like, so that's a really big problem for your buyer. And they're like, yes. We're like, maybe we should dig into that and talk about it. And where I think it gets uncomfortable is we'll hear things like, I don't think we can go there. There's ways to dig into it and really think about it. And if it feels like an uncomfortable thought, you're probably on to something. Because quite frankly, and we've said it before, when you're developing a unique point of view, if everybody agrees with you, if there's no discomfort there, it is not a unique point of view. And and you yep. need to keep that in mind. If it comes too easy... <laughs> You probably need to dig a little deeper and think a little harder about it and make sure nobody else is talking about it. You know, and the 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 beautiful thing coming out of those workshop sessions is then it's now time to map out your unique point of view story framework. So let's talk a little bit about what that unique point of view story framework actually looks like. So the way that we go about it at Growth Mode Marketing is we define pillars, three key themes that support your unique point of view. So whatever the story is that you've you've kind of developed in these workshops and in this questionnaire and everything, we we think it works out really well to define three key themes. And each of those would be would be capturing core points that paint the story around each of those themes, right? And so you kind of go you start with the, the top levels and then you go another level deeper to the core points. And then under that, there's even a few more bullet points. So when it comes down to it, you actually have quite a bit of things to work with to tell your story uh, you know, amongst all of your different marketing programs. All the pillars tie back up to that unique point of view. So you've got a unique point of view statement. Sometimes that unique point of view statement standing alone, you're like, well, that, come on, that's not much. It's the story and the framework that you build underneath it that really brings it to life. And we like to work in threes. So, you know, it's three pillars and then there's three beams under each pillar and there's bullet points under each of those. So by the time we get done and we're delivering to our clients the actual framework mapped out, to Jenny's point, it's pretty meaty and there's a lot to work with to now go and tell your story consistently. So it doesn't mean I talk about one thing and I talk about it over and over and over to ad nauseum. It's that's one of the pieces that I weave into the story consistently because it all maps back up to that unique point of view statement and all ties together. But you're consistently telling these stories that are all interrelated to each other. And it's actually quite powerful and helps a marketing team stay hyper focused when they're creating content because now moving forward, you're looking at this story framework. And you're mapping out your blog articles and your podcast topics and your marketing campaigns. Then you can sit there and, and kind of gut check like, okay, did these topics tie into our unique point of view story framework? If the answer is no, we probably need to refocus and make sure we're telling that story consistently. And it actually may seem to you like you're telling the same thing ad nauseum. (laughs) But honestly, (laughs) when it's going out in different, you know, formats, and you take different pieces of it, and you break it out amongst all of the different things that you're doing, it doesn't seem that way to your ideal customer profile. You know, I mean, they don't see it that way that you're 
constantly repeating yourself. That's just because you're the one in the thick of it. (laughs) Right. And if you think about it, like we said before, Gartner says it takes an average of 66 touches for somebody to actually pay attention. Think about it for every piece that you put out. How many times did they need to see that message before it sticks? And how many more times do they need to see that message before you find them repeating it and saying, this is what we need because this is our challenge and we're looking at this. Like over time, you know, and this is the whole philosophy around the demand generation engine and building it out, you're attracting buyers that this resonates with if they're making up to 80% of that purchase decision by the time that they engage with a sales rep your message is finally getting through to them. You want prospects to come to you and start to repeat back your story to you. Like, these are the challenges I'm having. This is why I'm doing this. And, you know, like when you hear that as a sales rep, it's probably like, yes, like their job just, you know, got a little bit easier because you have somebody who's pretty committed already to working with you because they've really bought into your story. So with a unique point of view, the thing is, it's it's never fully baked, right? It's, there's always going to be things changing in the market, changing in the industry, changing in your company. So it's something that you always want to be testing and refining once you've got it, you know, once you've got it figured out and you're out in the market with it. Just keep trying it in different places and, you know, testing it out. And then what do you, even your analytics are telling you? Like, is this, you know, what's resonating better with other people because maybe something that you decided doesn't work as good as something else that you decided or you know so you want to use just use it as a map for creating more content in the future to to help you to figure out what's what's going to be the best message and so that you're hyper focused on that icp absolutely and you know i think to kind of sum that up greg when you have the unique point of view story framework finally mapped out it doesn't end there You've got to implement it. You've got to test it. You've got to refine it. And that is about, you know, like I think the first step is implementing the story across your existing content. So look at your website. How do you rework the copy and the content on there to help tell that story? Look at your existing sales tools. Look at your marketing collateral. In addition to using that as a map to craft that future content to keep you hyper-focused so you can tell that consistent story over and over and over, (laughs) you know, and and continue to, to test that viewpoint and that story by gauging reactions and looking at what I like to call like micro measurements of how your ideal customer profile is responding. So as you're looking at that and you're learning, like refine based on what you're learning from that test. So it should be an iterative process. And when you find what is really resonating, lean into it. Because maybe you've got these three pillars and collectively it tells this great story, but maybe one of the pillars resonates more. And you're seeing that in in your micro measurements because you're putting email campaigns out and you're seeing they're clicking through more on that topic. Great. That doesn't mean you have to completely go change your unique point of view story framework. It just means I'm going to lean in more to that pillar and create more content specific to that. And maybe the other two pillars are kind of secondary to it. But I think it's really important as you implement it that you have everyone in your organization on the same page. Not only is it a marketing tool, but does sales understand it When your leaders are speaking at conferences, are they sticking to the story framework and telling that, you know, you really got to think about how do I roll it out across the organization and make it a living, breathing document, not just a, we created it, we're going to set it aside, we'll check back on it in a couple of years, like use it because, you know, it really is a great guide and, and a powerful tool for you. Thanks for joining us on the Demand Gen Fix a podcast for HR tech marketers brought to you by Growth Mode Marketing. We sure hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe for more perspectives on demand generation and B2B marketing strategies. Plus, give us a like. Tell your friends. We'll see you next time.